Welcome to the course Environmental Impact Assessments and today we are going to cover um, land acquisitions, resettlement and livelihoods under the umbrella uh, topic of EIA methods. So a key reference for this particular section is chapter 15 land acquisition, resettlement and livelihoods from Terrible and Wood's book on methods. So, uh, the coverage for this particular session will include that we are going to look at uh, the methods and the purpose of scoping and uh, initial planning involved uh, in uh, land acquisition and resettlement. And then we will look at how do we undertake profiling and how do we undertake baseline data collection. Thereafter, we will look at uh, uh, how do we develop resettlement action plans, what are the key elements of developing resettlement action plans and then we will look at some of the examples related to that. And then uh, we will look at the uh, like how, what other aspects you handle like how do you really implement uh, the action plans and how do you hand over that and then what are the other elements of livelihood restoration and enhancements and then how do you take care of monitoring and evaluation what it means and what do you really do within that. So accordingly the learning outcome expected from you after completion of this particular session is that you should be able to define and discuss uh, and identify key elements of scoping and initial planning related with the uh, land acquisition and resettlement and then you should be able to identify var various zones of project influence within this. Further, you should be able to understand how you create profile and how do you collect baseline data and how do you process baseline data for the purpose of land acquisition and resettlement and then uh, we'll look at, uh, you would, should be able to uh, identify different elements, components of resettlement action plan and then what are the elements of uh, implementation and, ha and how, or what are the procedure involved in handover. So you should be able to explain those and then you should be able to explain livelihood restoration, what it means, what does enhancement means and then what are the options available for the purpose and then you should be able to discuss and review monitoring and evaluation challenges of uh, land acquisition and resettlement. So that is what uh, we look forward to for this particular session. So moving on to scoping and initial planning, uh, we see that uh, whenever you are doing this you need to ask key questions like to what extent the land is uh, land will be acquired, what will be your scale of land acquisition and how many people will be resettled, where you will resettle them, how, what will be the really the quantum of resettlement which will take place because of your project. So in the scoping stage you need to have those kind of understanding and then you also need to look at what will be the cost of compensation and mitigation measures. So how are you going to compensate that and uh, what will be the cost, the cost which will come and how and uh, for any kind of residual impact how you are going to mitigate and what will be the mitigation measures. So you need to undertake those in the scoping stage. And then you also need to look into the feasibility of the project. So you'll be implementing the project and then you'll all be also encountering land acquisition as well as resettlement and then there's a cost in the compensation and mitigation. So you also need to look into the feasibility of the entire, how much you're going to invest and how much you're really going to get back from the project. And then uh, another key aspect which you need to take care in the scoping stage is to look at the stakeholders view about the project and it's very important to have thorough community engagement at the every stage of your designing because this can be very exhausting and it can also lead to a lot of litigation uh, issues later. And when you do a uh, scoping for the land acquisition and resettlement so uh, you should follow these general steps. Uh, you see that you need to first uh, uh, need to establish a multidisciplinary team. So you, you would need a multidisciplinary team. So you have already seen uh, the previous lecture we talked about socioeconomic impact assessment. So you see the range of impact it might happen and we are just dealing with one component about the uh, land acquisition and uh, resettlement here. So you would really need a multidisciplinary team 
and uh, you need to also review the design of the project, how the project has been de designed. So like you saw uh, when we were looking at the monitoring part in the previous lecture, we see how much jobs they have created, how many people, local people have been employed in the project and so on. So uh, those kind of understanding you really need to look into. So uh, you need to review the project design and then you need to, while reviewing the project design, you need to look into the environmental and social component of the project, what it offers to the environment, for the environment as well as for the, uh, so, uh, the host community. And then you also need to look into uh, that how much the project design itself allows you to minimize land acquisition and resettlement. So it's been emphasized a lot that the land acquisition should be as minimum as possible, optimum as possible, and the need for resettlement also should be minimized as much as possible. So you need to review the project design for that purpose. And then uh, you also further need to review the existing primary and secondary socioeconomic data. So you need to see what's really going on in that host community with respect to uh, the socioeconomic scenario there. So you would be looking at the pro looking at the secondary data as well as looking at the primary data, various kind of surveys which you you would be conducting. And uh, further, at this stage, you might also look at other projects, so benchmark projects, where you would look at the other projects and, uh, and looking at the other projects is going to help you to understand what are the other issues which might um, happen and which you might have to deal in your particular context and what kind of compensation uh, has to be given for that. There are like, uh, you've already seen in the Indian context how we have a very defined formula-based comp com compensation which is already in place. So all, all that benchmark of the other project would help you to identify that. And then you also need to look at the kind of conflicts which might come. Uh, so from the benchmark of a benchmark study of the other project would help you with that. And then you might also look at what kind of solutions they had adopted. Further, you would also look at uh, the like you, in this, uh, once you understand all this, you have to create a lot of maps and information which you have generated. So you can use GIS for this. You can create different kind of layers, layers indicating the project infrastructure, the demographic profile, the environmental buffer, how from the project side you have protected the people. So how, what kind of environmental buffers you have created and then, um, how, what are the impacted communities, what kind of community infrastructure are there, what are the key features and resources, and then you also need to identify zones of project influence. So what are these zones of influence? Looking at uh, zones of influence, you see that uh, uh, some uh, the literature identifies two key zones of inf uh, influence, the primary zone, zone of direct impact, and then you also see secondary zone. So zone of direct impact is like wherever your project activity is going to happen. So where uh, for your project, the road is coming, for your project, the building is being built, where you're drawing uh, the resources from. So those are all zones of direct impact because your activities will be taking place at that particular area. So that would be like a primary zone and zone of direct impact. Then there are secondary zone which are like the larger region in which the project is located and, and uh, will have economic impact because of the kind of activity you're doing in your project area. So uh, because of that, because of the development which is happening, you might have other economic migrants coming to the place. So they might think of more uh, uh, like uh, they might get more and more opportunities. So they might be coming to that place. So th those kind of economic migrants would also come. And then uh, they, there might be increased opportunity for business. So bus it might also attract other business community business communities to move on to that particular place. So then you also need to identify those zones and that would be secondary zone. Uh, so uh, uh, you need to identify those kind of zones in your steps for scoping for land acquisition and resettlement purpose. 
So uh, while you are doing the scoping, visit to the site is very, very important at this stage and uh, one also needs to very carefully engage. Uh, it is said that very careful engagement has to be done because uh, as a professional you have to avoid creating expectations. So many a time you might end up telling that such kind of infrastructure will be developed, this will be developed, uh, the uh, hospitals, schools will be developed, which, uh, which uh, the project by the original design, by the time it's implemented, a lot might change. So you have to be very careful what kind of expectations you are raising. It's better to avoid to create that kind of expectation. And uh, also, you need to be careful and then take care of the local protocol for the purpose. Uh, particularly uh, how you enter a community. So uh, you have to take care about the local tradition, the political leadership, and uh, you need to notify key community and uh, the, uh, the adopted governance system before you enter any community for any kind of data collection or uh, any kind of information sharing or gathering. So that all things have to be taken care of. So uh, you have to be careful here because there might be chances of final project footprint might change and, uh, and uh, you should also uh, ensure that you do not give away too much information or unnecessary information because by the time the projects are implemented a lot changes uh, as per the process itself. So project design changes, the land acquisition requirement might vary. So uh, that might cause unnecessary stress for the people. So uh, un unnecessary and not too much of information should not be shared. So while you undertake site visits during the scoping stage, you should gather information and then you would gather information from uh, preliminary survey, you would also organize community and then uh, you would also uh, like uh, undertake certain decision making then you would also look at the settlement layout, what kind of housing and infrastructure is already there, and then you would also try to find out what kind of social infrastructures are there, what are the kind of different economic activities which are being taking place in that particular scenario. So once you undertake this, you also need to prepare a scoping report. So once you have taken this state, so you may prepare uh, as a team, you might also prepare a scoping report related with land acquisition and resettlement. And in this, you may outline how the land acquisition and resettlement proce process should go ahead. And then you would also budget for your particular process from staffing, like how much staff you would need, what kind of work plan you would need, how much money you would need, and what will be the time schedule which you would follow. So scoping reports would be another important element here. So that was about the scoping. So moving on, now looking at the profiling and the baseline data collection. So. Um, uh, it's very important that when we are doing baseline, though monitoring comes later in the stage, it's important that when you're taking baseline um, study and un undertaking baseline study, you should be very clear about uh, what kind of monitoring indicators you will be using so that you collect data or have a good understanding about it, how you're going to monitor it. So that should be developed uh, at this stage itself. And uh, at this stage, you should all, you and your team should work out database requirements uh, well in advance. So before you uh, collect the data, you should know how you're going to organize the data, how you're going to uh, uh, analyze the data, so that as the data comes, there'll be a lot of data which will come at the land acquisition and resettlement, so you need to plan well ahead. So you, you need uh, to see that whether you're going to use Excel or you would use Access or uh, SQL databases or you can integrate it in GIS environments. You can have all attributes and geographical data integrated together. So you need to decide what uh, mode of data recording and how you're going to analyze all those data has to be taken care of here itself. And when you undertake profiling and baseline data collection, uh, uh, the key outcome of this process is that uh, you prepare the social profile. You let 
uh, people know what wh wh what is the scenario, what's the social profile, and uh, you need to describe the affected communities. So people who are going to be affected, you need to describe them. You need to describe them in terms of numbers, in terms of the characteristics which is there. And uh, another thing you would need to come up with is what will be the major concerns about resettling those affected people. So whether they are uh, resettling from the economic point of view or resettling from the physical point of view, what will be the key concern associated with that? So uh, the, when you undertake a comprehensive baseline, the critical purpose is that you look into the environmental and social impacts, what kind of impacts would happen. And then you also look at the risk and opportunities. So what are the risk and opportunities involved in this? And then you also look at the eligibility for compensation. So there might be a lot of confusion, a lot of things. So who all are eligible for compensation and resettlement uh, for housing purpose and how you're going to monitor uh, the uh, 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 implementation, uh, resettlement action plan, how you're going to monitor that, how you're going to implement that, and uh, how you're going to prepare environmental and social management plans. So when you, uh, when you do the baseline study, the key data source is the census data, and uh, you undertake socioeconomic baseline survey, and when you do those these things, you undertake survey, you collect data on household how much access they have to services, uh, how, uh, services like what access they have to education, healthcare, water, education, what uh, kind of capacities are there, what kind of training institutions are there. And you also take information on the what kind of job opportunities are there, livelihood opportunities are there. Uh, what uh, and uh, within this you look at whether they are primary, tertiary, secondary in nature, what nature of uh, opportunities are there in that particular area. For, uh, further, when you're collecting these baseline data, you need to be very careful that you need to have restricted access to these data, huge amount of data which you're going to collect because uh, there can be a lot of uh, fraud or misuse of these data. Uh, and it might also create a lot of uh, stress at the later, and tension at the later part. So you need to be very careful how much the data is shared and how many people have access to this. So you need to take care of that. Further, when you're dealing with this, you also need to uh, meet the national, regional, and international legal requirements. So you need to also be aware of that. We have talked about legal requirements in our country, India, and then we have also talked about uh, World Bank standards, so you need to look at all those aspects. And further, you also need to ensure that you have qualified people as per the national standards of where you're doing it. So you need to ensure that you have a survey team uh, which, uh, which, has, uh, which are qualified to undertake these kind of work, and then any kind of objection which comes, then they can independently handle it. And then also they would be requiring project-oriented training uh, for the team purpose. And also you need to take care of the quality control measures uh, during surveying and data because you'll be collecting a lot of data. So how are you going to take care of the quality control? So who all will go for survey, how they have uh, entered the data. So it is suggested that all the data should be checked on daily basis in terms of input and then also make provisions for explaining in local languages and then also translations of those for the government entity and the local people. So you have to ensure that that where you're recording local people understands what data you're collecting from them. And uh, when you're looking at this, you also need to look at how you're taking record of the owner, how you're recording their assets, how you are verifying their IDs, so that all has to be taken care of. And you have to ensure that each forms which you're using for documentation is also signed by the owner, um, and they are able to read it and understand it, signed or thumbprints, whichever way it is required. 
So uh, you would also, depending on the context, you might also need some special studies to be undertaken for this purpose to understand the host community, the livelihood options, what are there are related with agriculture, fishing, herding, hunting and all these biodiversity and ecosystem services. So specialized studies might also be required. So uh, that was about the baseline study. So now uh, moving on to the Development of Resettlement Action Plan, RAP. So uh, what is RAP? Resettlement Action Plan is uh, like a sub plan uh, of the overall environmental, uh, um, ma environmental management plan uh, for the uh, project and uh, it's important that uh, uh, EIA and uh, RAP, Resettlement Action Plan, uh, they, the teams, the workforce which are working on it work jointly to identify the impacts and mitigation measures. So one thing one, we need to understand from the practice point of view that uh, the impact assessment, what you're doing, or management plan, usual, uh, impact assessment, what you will do, uh, comes in the early stage of the project to get the necess necessary approval. So that would come early, but RAP is taken when the project is approved. So once you're, it's approved and then how you're handling those, all those aspects so that uh, it comes in later part of this. But it is suggested that you should have a similar team and they should be, uh, the team engaged in preparing the RAP should be involved from the beginning of the project so that the key elements are considered in the project. So let us see the resettlement action plan guidance given by IUCN here. So you can look at what's the purpose of the resettlement action plan. So you see that the purpose of uh, purpose is to especially specify all resettlement arrangements and the measures for avoiding, minimizing or compensating losses or other negative social impacts resulting from resettlement. And then uh, a re resettlement action plan would have, like this is the structure you can see, introduction, uh, why the resettlement is happening, the legal framework within it is working, the resettlement and relocation, what kind of things will happen and uh, what baseline has been done, what is the procedure and mechanism adopted, what's the schedule, and then uh, uh, what kind of compensation and livelihood restoration and enhancement uh, has been undertaken, so that has to be covered. And then you also need to show the implementation arrangements, uh, how you're going to implement it, what is the budget and financial arrangement, how you're going to monitor and evaluate it, and what kind of grievance mechanism you're going to have, and what kind of further hand-holding guidance you're going to provide. So uh, you also see the book provides components of standard resettlement action plan. Uh, you see the project description, you have potential impact, zone of impact and alternatives which you have considered, the magnitude of displacements, what number proportion of people will be displaced or migrated, house, the impact on the household structure, community buildings, so on, and then the legal and institutional framework. Then. Uh, the baseline study, what kind of surveys you have undertaken, then how you have engaged with the stakeholders and summary of the public consultation and what kind of disclosures were done for the resettlement planning and how did you engage with the local households, local authorities, NGOs and host community and what kind of uh, system you have in place for addressing the grievances and uh, what will be your eligibility and uh, criteria and how you're going to put the value to the losses and how you're going to work out the compensation. And then uh, what is the methodology which you're adopting for uh, assessing or giving a value to what kind of losses which will happen. So mostly you'll have as per the local law what has to be done. And then what uh, you have to give information on livelihood restoration how you're restoring it, how you're restoring the housing infrastructure and social services. So you need to give housing plan, infrastructure plan, social plan. Then further you also need to give like special assistance to vulnerable groups, 
So what kind of assistance you would give to vulnerable groups, people of different gender, ethnicity, age, mental disability, uh, economic disadvantage or social status. Uh, so all this has to be given and what kind of organizational responsibilities so that you can show that whomever you are giving the charge, they are ab able, capable to handle this and what will be the schedule, what will be the budget and what will be the monitoring and evaluation and reporting system. So that would also involve like how the community will be engaged and how you will also take care of completion audit when you're going to hand over how you're going to um, undertake the audit about how the targets have been achieved or not. So you may also revisit all the available framework in this regard. So you have uh, handbooks for preparation of settlement action plan by IFC World Bank. So they also give you outline for the resettlement action plan. You can see the introduction, minimizing resettlement, census and socioeconomic survey, legal framework, resettlement sites, how you have to look at it income restoration, how you're doing institutional arrangements, how you're going to schedule the implementation of the project, how you're undertaking participation and consultation, how you're having the grievance readdressal system, then monitoring and evaluation, the cost and budget, and what kind of other data you have to give. So that is uh, about the content of the resettlement action plan. So now looking at the stages of resettlement action plan as given by IFC, you can see here in the table. So you have all these stages, five stages given by them where you can see the pre-feasibility scoping of EIA, pre-EIA stage, how you undertake, what kind of information is provided. Then you have feasibility where you prepare the resettlement action plan preparation stage. So you undertake the prepare and circulate terms of reference, you ha hire specialist services, identify alternatives for the project. Likewise, you see in the stage three, you have technical design, technical design of um, RAP preparation. How do you design that? Um, how do you engage services of EIA and resettlement experts? And uh, what all uh, data are collected? Then you can see stage four, uh, another uh, stage you see, preliminary technical design, re prepare resettlement action plan, and then you submit for EIA and the review purpose. Then you see the implementation part in stage four, so which is implement environmental and social management plan, RAP and associated development initiatives in sequence with the project implementation. So how do you take care of the implementation part and then the stage five deals with evaluation. So how do you undertake independent financial and completion audit and correct corrective actions if needed. So these are the key stages identified by the World Bank on resettlement action planning and implementation. I've also uh, taken a snip of uh, how the budget for resettlement action plans are also prepared. You can see the operation compensation, land acquisition, settlement resettlement site planning, so how you can see from salaries to office administration to compensation, land acquisition site planning, how the cost has been identified, the timing has been identified, the sources of fund and channel of uh, disbursement has been identified here. So you can look at that. Now looking at another uh, key concept here about the r risk management. So you may also refer to IFC PS Performance uh, Standard 1 for assessment and management of environmental and social risk and also the adoption of the, mit uh, of the mitigation. So uh, there we had seen uh, these concepts, you can revisit that. So all impacts and risk related to resettlement must be identified. So you need to look at what are the risks involved and then you need to integrate it with overall risk management process. So for each risk, a mitigation measurement or uh, RAP package must be developed. So whatever risk you are foreseeing, the mitigation measure, or you have to prepare a RAP package for that. So extent of risk, uh, resettlement impact would depend on like what is the magnitude of displacement, how many people are getting displaced, what's the characteristic of the project, and what are the mitigation measure. 
as well as the characteristic of the community. So, uh, impacts are usually assessed using the standard risk assessment process where you look at the risk, uh, uh, risk which, is the ca which is categorized as like the opposite of the likelihood of risk occurring with the consequences of that risk. So, looking at the typical social impact arising from a resettlement, so it is uh, uh, what really happens, what kind of social impact happens because of the resettlement. Uh, you see that people's capability, ability and freedom to achieve their goals gets influenced. So, they do not have the same environment, their quality of life changes, there might be things become expensive because of inflation, the cost of living goes high. So, their capacities is lowered, so that kind of things happen. And then you also see community social supports and political context also changes, so no more the same network, human resource network which you had uh, exists. So, there is a breakdown of social support, there is a, a kind of social uh, changes, you, the, especially the vulnerable household, they become much more vulnerable and then they also get isolated from their own uh, support system. Then there is also ch uh, change in livelihood assets and activities, so what I was able to do, go for fishing or uh, earn from fishing no more, I am able to undertake that. So, there is a loss of resources and then uh, most of the time jobs are created, but, uh, but it also not everybody is able to take care of, uh, take, uh, make best use of the opportunity. So, uh, that also creates inequality within the community and it is said that most of the time the jobs which are created are taken from the people from outside who come uh, in migrate to the place. And then there is also issue about access to cultural and religious resources and then also access is hindered to the infrastructure and services also. As well as you see there is limitation on housing and business structure. And uh, uh, there is also oh, like lot of reliance on the cash compensation and many a times people do not know how to use that, uh, that cash. So, that also causes lot of uh, challenges. Then you also see poor living environments. So, when the planning, the uh, resettlement plans are not done well, that also leads to deterioration of living environment. When the environmental buffers are in and around the project are not designed well, they are inadequate, that also leads to poor living quality, like there might be a lot of dust, noise, vibration because of the project, because of the lack of environmental buffers, which should have been created at the project site. So, uh, here we can uh, see an example of a matrix of selected impact indicators uh, by the World Bank. So, how uh, we can indicate the impacts in form of matrix. So, uh, uh, IFC suggests that to prepare a matrix of impact indicators. So, you can see here category of indicators, social, economic, health and then all kind of parameters, indicators which are there, registered crime, crime crime dispute involving women, crime dispute involving vulnerable groups and then baseline like six month period study and then what is the actual target which one wants to achieve there. I have also given you the link if you wish to download this and see. And then you also need to look at the considerable time allocation for resettlement and then you also need to formulate the resettlement committee to take care of all the concerns. So, uh, you would also be required to undertake uh, resettlement action plan consultation and negotiations. So, you need to engage with wide range of community. Then you also need to have, uh, uh, especially IFC recommends to have a resettlement committee and then you should have representatives from the proponent of the project, you need to have representatives from the government, you need to have representative from the people who are going to be affected, community from uh, which uh, uh, community people who will be affected. So, you need to have representatives from there, you need to have representative from the host community and NGOs and other things. So, resettlement committee is it, uh, uh, like emphasized in IFC and then uh, you also need to look at the compensation arrangement. So, this is a critical step and then we have seen how India deals with it. 
we had seen in the legislation part. So, as for the, in the international standards, the prod, it is like generally said that the uh, compensation should be in kind rather than cash, uh, because it had shown certain um, uh, limitation about how the cashes are handled. And uh, also the large amount of payment distorts the prices and also leads to a lot of inflation and uh, also encourages transition of the local areas. So you, uh, you might be required to develop a compensation framework, how you're going to distribute the compensation, or how you're going to calculate the compensation as well as how you're going to look at the eligibility rules for that. So you also find IFC recommendations uh, for uh, uh, how to prepare the project entitlement and the matrix to identify them. So you look at the affected people, uh, usually they are the pr uh, uh, property and land right owners, tenants, squatters, sharecroppers, grazers, nomadic pastoralists and other natural resource users, vendors and other service providers. So all those affected people have to be identified. You might also revisit the legislation part which we saw for Indian context. Then all type of loss, what kind of impacts which are happening from each category including loss of physical assets, loss of access to physical assets, assets and loss of wages, loss of rent, sales and loss of public infrastructure. Uh, elements of cultural significance, all those kinds of all types of loss have to be identified and types of compensation and what kind of support you are extending that all has to be included. So here you can see the entitlement matrix sample taken from IFC report. So you can see the category of uh, project affected people PAP. So you see property owners, tenants, quarters and types of loss, loss of land, loss of structure, then loss of rental accommodation, loss of land. What kind of compensation has been done for the structure, compensation done for the assets, compensation for loss of income, what kind of moving allowances has been given and what kind of other support are provided through that. So you see the entitlement matrix, how it is prepared and then you also look into the site selection for uh, resettlement. So it's a very important task and can have major ongoing social impact for the resettled people. So how, where do you really locate them? That has to be really seen well and do, does it really helps them to reestablish uh, their uh, life. And uh, you need to uh, uh, establish resettlement site selection criteria how on what basis you're going to select a site. So you need to assign, uh, develop those parameters and then you also need to look at the project design and uh, you need to look at the life of the project and then look at the land acquisition requirement and then ensure that environmental buffers are correctly identified and implemented in the project. Then you also need to do land use mapping, primary options assessment. So how you will do, what kind of radius you're going to take what kind of data sources you're going to use like satellite, aerial imagery, what kind of maps you're going to prepare. So all those maps have to be prepared in your uh, RAP. So a uh, project uh, can identify all, all sites options which are there for different users. And then uh, you also need to undertake primary op uh, assessment. So what kind of options which are available for primary assessment? So when you're doing assessment for the reset, uh, resettlement site also, you need to see whether the water is available or not, quality of water, quantity of water. You also need to look at the tropography, the drainage, the soil quality, stability of the preferred site. Uh, all these should be undertaken. And you should also undertake suitability analysis for the resettlement site and then see how well it is feasible for the construction of the resettlement housing and the infrastructure project and then what is the potential for future growth also that all needs to be seen. And uh, you have already seen how do we undertake study to look at the water topography and all those aspects. So all that has to be covered in um, REP. And then uh, you also need to whatever you study from the primary options, you need to share it with the stakeholders and you need to have discussion with them and you need to have a social framework 
to indicate what are the different advantages and disadvantages of different options which are available to them. And uh, you, uh, one thing you should take care that when you are dealing with stakeholders, they should be allowed to weight between things. So, what parameters are weighted more for them compared to job or the resources or community infrastructure, what, what parameters are weighted more for them and what, uh, what are less weighted for them. So, you need to take care of those aspects. And then you also need to look into the design of the resettlement housing well, and in while you are designing the resettlement housing, you need to look at the, uh, you need to ensure participatory approach and you need to ensure that the quality of life improves with that. So that was about the uh, resettlement action plan. So now moving on, looking at the implementation handover of the uh, RAP. So implementation means putting the RAP into action and then handing over process uh, when, when the project is like now. Uh, owner cannot be lifelong associated with it uh, settlement, so they need to hand it over after some time. So that process is handing over and what kind of support would continue or uh, like uh, what restoration has been achieved. So all those has to be taken care of. So handover process. The project has a responsibility to assist resettlement community in becoming fully established in the new location. So that's the uh, that's the responsibility of the project that they ensure that people are fully settled. So that is about the implementation and handover. And within that, you see that they have to ensure that livelihood restoration and enhancement has happened. And uh, this is the most difficult part of the resettlement. So. Uh, when you are restoring, resettling people. So that is the very difficult part and uh, the purpose of project is generally to facilitate that economic growth of an area. And so a lot of estimations are made but it seems to be very difficult to attain. So IFC also provides uh, guidelines to the companies to improve or restore the livelihood and standards of living or dispersed, uh, displaced persons and you can see in uh, IFC 2012A, you can see here. And then um, for the successful livelihood restoration, it's important to enable access to economic opportunities. So people should have access to all the economic opportunities and uh, people, uh, all people, f women, young people, skilled people, unskilled people, all of them should have access to economic opportunities. So that all has to be ensured further the training opportunities uh, should be ensured that people are trained enough to take the benefit of the economic opportunities which comes up there. Uh, further you see that uh, IFC also defines the uh, vulnerable or at risk groups. So people like with the difference of gender, ethnicity, age, physical, mental disability also there are certain people at risk. So one uh, in the RP that also needs to be taken care of. You particularly see in IFCPS one requires project to identify vulnerable groups in the EIA process, and it requires them to give special measures to engage with them and support them in the re resettlement process. So that needs to be ensured. So th that was about it. Now looking at the monitoring and evaluation. So monitoring and evaluation. Um, it is the critical part and uh, it allows you to give, uh, it allows feedback on what kind of problems are happening, what kind of problems we have been able to solve, whether we have been able to deal with it or not. So uh, uh, these monitoring and evaluation plan, they are usually prepared as the part of REP and uh, it is uh, Implementation depends on uh, how well you have established the indicators during the baseline data designing. So depending on that and the, there are certain key indicators uh, qualitative as well as quantitative which uh, helps you to monitor. So whether the payment of compensation has been made or not, resolution of grievance system is there or not, community perception, what is the community perception towards the project so you can regularly monitor that. And then you can also monitor the change in household income, agriculture productivity and employment and so on. So that helps you. And then in the end you can see that close out 
audit is also required to assess if the uh, RAP which was developed has been successful or not. So, you need to be very careful the timing of the close out uh, audit and usually it depends on the complexity of the how complex the uh, rehabilitation was, restoration was. So, uh, if it is complex the time would be at the later period. Usually it takes 3 to 5 years after the land has been acquired, but uh, as for the experience it can take up to 10 years. So, by, by the time people settle in a new place it takes 10 years for uh, closing or handing over to it. So, looking at some of the examples, I have also given you the link here. So, you can see the socio-economic impact assessment scoping report here. So, uh, this is from South Africa, you can see here. So, this I have given you the link and you can see the approach of study, what they have adopted. You can see the project area. Uh, it is the mine project. So, you can see how they are reviewing the socioeconomic data in their approach to the study on the right hand side. You can see the review of relevant planning policy framework for the area, review of information from the similar studies, review of social issues associated with the mining projects. So, the, what we had discussed in the scoping stage, you can see how they are implementing it. Then they have also presented summary of social impact. You can see the different impacts which they have perceived in this calculated estimated in this project, all those direct employment, business opportunities, safety and security, significance without mitigation like medium, low, medium, low, significance with mitigation, so how it is coming up. Then you can see in the next table summary of social impact associated with the operational phase. The first one was the construction phase. We are looking at the operational phase, what kind of employment it is generating what kind of what is the significance of the mitigation uh, of the impact without mitigation and with mitigation. Here you can see uh, how they have identified the area uh, of impact zone. You can see here location what kilo 10 kilometers they have taken from the proposed site. Here you can see the summary of social impact associated with decommissioning of the phase, job losses, loss of income. So, how they have done this. Another example which we had seen earlier also, uh, the social impact assessment report from Mumbai Metro Line 3. So, you see the table of contents, how they have done the land acquisition and resettlement, how they are looking into minimizing resettlement, what is the purpose of social impact assessment and then what kind of study approach they have adopted. You can see how the survey and community and public cons consultation becomes important part. You can see from the report SNP how they have undertaken that and then how they have taken impact and inventory loss and how they are indicating all that project impact loss, the land requirement and acquisition, uh, how they are, uh, what, what are the documentation, inventory of the structural loss you can see from the project. Another project you can see from Vietnam. Uh, this was prepared for uh, funding agency Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank AIIB. So, here you can see the land acquisition completion report for the hydropower plant. So, you can look at the table of contents. So, you see the uh, audit methodology, how they are looking at the scope of land acquisition and resettlement, the legislative review, the audit finding, what are the different uh, findings in that information disclosure, eligibility and entitlement, compensation and assistance payment, resettlement sites, income restoration, grievance redressal, indigenous people and all the uh, documents which are there. Plus, you can see the list of tables, number of household surveys by affected villagers, number of FD FGDs, uh, participants, land used by project component, affected households, number of PDs. But types of relocation, survey po surveyed population, then vulnerability characteristics. So, all that has been done here. You can see the project location, resettlement site and then you can look at the objective of this particular pro uh, uh, reporting, conducting detailed gap analysis to identify gap against economic and social policy and standards of uh, 
AIIBs and then determine the scope of displacement impact of by the project, finding out status of displaced indigenous people, assessing the adequacy and effectiveness of public consultation, providing recommendation and a time bound action to address the shortcomings in land acquisition and resettlement. And so you see the scope of audit, how they are taking audit, how they are undertaking land acquisition completion report what all they are going to show scope of impacts, information disclosure, eligibility and entitlement. So you saw all these things conceptually, you can see here in the example, the methodology they have adopted, documentation review, site visits. Then you see the tables, how they have indicated the number of household surveys, then uh, focus group discussions, how did they have with various groups, economic, uh, economically displaced household, indigenous people, vulnerable group, concentration relocation household, self re relocation household, and then number of FGDs conducted, percentage of that, and then key informant interviews, site walks, what they did, what kind of assessment criteria they had. So they have uh, given all those details, scope of land acquisition and resettlement, scope of impact, affected land, affected household. So all this a very, very big list has been given. Uh, I have given you the link to this report. Then you can also look at the legislative review they have undertaken, then what's the requirement of the international funding agency and then the local requirements and what kind of gaps they have identified. So we have seen some examples, I've also given you the link to those examples. So that is what we covered in today's session. So summarizing what we covered, we looked into the scoping and initial planning uh, related with what are the different zones of project influence and then uh, with relation to land acquisition and resettlement. We looked at how we undertake profiling and baseline data collection, then how oh, we develop resettlement action plans, the key elements and the phases of it, then how do we implement and hand it over and then what do we mean by livelihood restoration and enhancement and how does it become the part of resettlement action plan and then we also looked at monitoring and evaluation. So that was all for today's session. Uh, these were the references used in this. And then these are the suggested watch and read. All that has links have been given to you. So please feel free to ask questions. Let us know about any concerns you have. Do share your opinions, experiences, and suggestions. Looking forward to interacting and co-learning with you while exploring AIA. Thank you.